This is Aliens and Artists, our conversation with Kay Randall May. Kay is a scientist, priestess, a professional intuitive. She started doing readings for other kids while just in grade school. Her family history is full of second sight and goes far back to Ireland. She attended seances at a young age and has her master's and PhD in biology, focusing on muscle and nerve interaction during metamorphosis in anthropods. Yeah. We discuss many things, among them whether quantum features like bilocation and entanglement can scale to macro, the dangers of entheogens as a spiritual path, physicists who are obsessed with subjectivity, but first, touching back on this sentiment within various religious systems that discourages people from pursuing such gifts because of its historical association with witchcraft. If you had these gifts historically, psi capacities, mediumship, clairvoyance, these are the people who got burned at the stake. And I wonder how you feel about current conditions. Are we dependably outgrowing that superstition that psi capacities are negative? Of course, my view is that they're part of our basic human constitution. It's just how we use them that determines their valence. How do you feel when you look back historically at all the people who have suffered, particularly women, the great liabilities of engaging their natural gifts? Okay, this is an interesting question, Stuart, and one that really deserves close scrutiny, because that's true Um, in many past centuries and epochs. Individuals who demonstrated some abilities of this nature were often misjudged or whatever. However, the abilities were taken quite seriously. They were believed in, okay? In our present culture, the age that we're living in probably for the last 150, 200 years, the more damaging aspect has been the rise of Newtonian science in the sense that I believe a misunderstanding of the natural world, of the nature of matter and the nature of energy is such that these abilities are just not thought to be possible. Therefore, on one hand, a person might be considered to be evil or malevolent or possessed or obsessed, but believed in. And on the other hand, a person is discounted and considered to be psychotic or at the most neurotic or mistaken or foolish. So on both sides of the spectrum, there is this sense of, well, you know, don't do this because this is something that's going to cost you your job. And I'm talking about this would be, let's say, if, let's say that someone experiences observing a uh, UFO or unidentified aerial phenomenon. Until relatively recently, and to some extent, even now, if that person shares their experience with their bosses at work or the authorities under which they work, they would be discounted. Um, If, let's say, they're a pilot, they would be not able to fly the plane because obviously they had delusions or some other problem. It's that modern discounting, which has been extraordinarily hurtful and often causes from many sides, uh, people who are well-meaning in families to discourage these abilities in their children. Because either you're going to be taken seriously and somebody's going to think you're, you know, going to harm them at a distance, or you're not going to be taken seriously and you're going to be thought of as insane or at least not rational. What I am saying is that as we come to understand physics better, especially as I've put forth in my book, Inner Visions of Matter and Subtle Energy, which was published in 2014 uh, through KMA Press, but other writings on quantum physics finally 
the scientific world and the institutions related to spiritual studies are going to meet on a common ground of understanding so that there is less marginalization and outright hostility toward these phenomena. And it boils down to the fact that, yes, the abilities that we're talking about, extended sensory perception abilities, are faculties. And yes, they can be misused. And they can be misused in ways which are harmful to the person who possesses them and others that they interact with or beneficial. In other words, prayer, for instance, can be used beneficially or people can pray against people. It's still prayer. I'm not saying that prayer is high sense perception. It, there is undoubtedly some other faculty involved here and forces beyond the individual. But I'm just giving that as an illustration that something which is innocuous and beneficial in one situation can be misused in another. And so it is with these faculties and actually with any of our faculties. If you think about them, the physical faculties of strength, mobility, vision, speech, all of them can be misused. The issue has been and still is that these faculties are often not perceived in quite the same ways. The same thing is true that can be said for an understanding of the very nature of interaction of people, how it is that there can even be consciousness between the thought processes of one individual and another. Newtonian physics says this is impossible. There's no connection between these two minds and they, you know the brains are not connected in any way it's absolutely impossible therefore any effect described in this way has to be either misinterpreted or the belief systems are psychotic or something but an understanding of quantum physics allows us to better understand that we have both the physical brain yes which has its synapses, has all of its physicality that we totally understand. And if something happens to your physical brain, you have problems. You cannot function normally as you did before. But beyond the physical brain, there is an energy field that I call the mind, not mind, like a mind field, but a mind field, which is um, energy which is not corporeal and it's that energy which I call pure energy still retains a degree of consciousness and can therefore mingle one person's consciousness influencing another's ultimately though that consciousness has of the mind mind field has to find its way through the brain. And that is where access is so important. And therefore, training in these abilities is one of learning how to access them reliably. Because, Stuart, let's face it, these abilities not only can be misused, but they can be misunderstood. And misinterpreted. So not every thought that a person has is necessarily purely intuitive. And there can be mistakes and there are mistakes. It's kind of like skating on an ice rink. You can easily get off track. So it's very, very important to be a critical thinker. By critical, I don't mean negative or harsh. By critical, I mean clear thinker, testing one's impressions, testing the abilities. And they are, they're real at all, which I know they are. You can test them. And if they're real, which I know they are, you can 
get stronger and stronger in access to them, while at the same time maintaining good mental health. And this is so very important because one has to, in my opinion, follow the precepts and understanding of wisdom in order to use the faculties that we have, all of our faculties, to the utmost. So if, if the typical physical senses can be misused, how much more can these high sense perception faculties be misused? So we've got to be very, very um, aware, not frightened. And that's why I think it's very important for children to be taught early. And when I was teaching Sunday school in, our, in, this, in the church that I eventually came to be in, uh, we, I taught the children and the people in the program were very much aware of this, the little ones, the toddlers, about how to use high sense perception. And we would pay attention to each other's auras and um, all kinds of interesting things. But they soon discovered that they could do some remote influencing too, which kind of made the game fun for some people. <laughs> so it's, it, there's the maturity level necessary here. I'm curious about your life story. At what point were your talents activated or enabled? Was there a eureka moment for you where you realized you have some exotic capacities? Can you tell us a bit about how you became aware you had these gifts? Oh, thank you, Stuart. Um, I, of course, was raised here in Phoenix, Arizona. I'm the only child and only grandchild of four delightful parents, parents and grandparents. And we all lived together in the same home or very close, like within a block from each other in my formative years from the time I was born with the exception of maybe one year or so, um, and then into grade school. And so I had a great deal of influence from my mother and my grandmother who were full-time parents and particularly my grandmother, who was a, a sensitive, she was a psychic, very in tune with the things that I do today as a um, intuitive consultant and medical intuitive. If she were still alive, she'd be doing the same thing. Um, in those days, which was many years ago, there was very little available in, in the outer world other than through what one was taught at home. And of course there was some literature, but my grandmother taught me mainly through games and reassurances. And it was just a normal, natural thing for me. All my developmental years, I was told that I was intuitive, that I had what was called by my grandmother, the second sight. Her mother came from Ireland and had the second sight. And I was told that this was something that was just part of the heritage of the family going back into the, I guess, the Celtic beginnings. <laughs> At any rate, I was told that because of that, uh, that the very things that we did, the games we played, that we followed our dreams, we talked about our dreams, nighttime dreams, and my grandmother and I uh, would do all kinds of guessing games and other kinds of things. My mother was not so much, she had the ability, she wasn't really interested in them as much. And for her, it was more a matter of, uh, she was interested in music and science and that kind of thing. Um, but with my grandmother, she being a nurse, she was interested in the physical body and we would often discuss different things because she wasn't working outside of the home. So it was a situation where I was immersed in it. And then um, grandmother was a good Catholic, but she was also a spiritualist. And we have a few spiritualist churches here in Phoenix. And one in particular called Harmony Chapel was where I would go with grandmother. She took me to a lot of seances and a lot of uh, bits of uh, being meeting this person and that person who would come into town and 
and do different, different demonstrations. And so from the time I was very little, it was just a normal part of my existence. I unfortunately lost my grandmother. She, she chose to graduate to another realm when I was only in sixth grade. So then I was on my own studying. I knew that I was interested in deeper intuitive insights. I worked with meditation, um, worked a little bit with self-hypnosis, but wasn't able to really master it in, my, in grade school without any help with anybody until much later in my life. And I also knew that I was going to be a scientist from the time I was in first grade. You know, people often have aspirations as to what they were going to be in life. Many of my friends were going to be nurses or secretaries or this, that, or the other thing. And my aspiration was I was going to be a scientist priestess. That was what I wanted to be. <laughs> and sure enough, I got there. <laughs> But I didn't know how I was going to get there. Uh, in the first year of high school, we one of the first assignments, we're told, write what you want to do when you grow up. And I wrote that I wanted to be a parapsychologist. And I wrote an essay called Parapsychology, a new science. Well, that was back in, would have been back in the early 50s. And there was nobody here in the Phoenix area, no no training possible for parapsychology. So I studied on my own and did a lot of study, ultimately deciding that I wanted to go into some science. And if it couldn't be parapsychology, it would probably be most likely one of the life sciences. And so I chose biology. And when I then graduated from high school, I was still all during these years working at meditating, um, studying on my own as much as possible, like the work of J.B. Ryan, uh, working with the Zener cards, working with other cards, uh, doing all kinds of experiments um, on my own. And a few years ago, one of my dearest, closest friends from grade school got back in touch with me. She found me on the Internet. And we were able to talk and catch up after many, many years. And you know how it is when somebody reaches out to you after many years, you don't know how much you should reveal. So she told me a little bit about her life. And I thought, ah, should I tell her that I'm a professional intuitive? I just don't know how well that will be received by her. And so finally, I, I, just, I, then I said, well, I'm a professional intuitive. I do readings and all this. She said, well, that doesn't surprise me. And I said, why? So well, you were doing readings for me in grade school. <laughs> I don't remember. And apparently I was the only person she had ever met who could tell her what she'd had for dinner the night before and tell her all the stuff. And I told her about past lives that she and I had had from the time we were in other lifetimes. I told her, and I told her that, and she said, what do you mean that we meet every time the swords are crossed? I said, I don't know. That was over 50 years ago. I told you that. I have no idea what it meant. So I'm still in touch with her after these many, many years. And so apparently I was doing readings even in grade school and some remote viewing. My grandmother, I remember telling me, um, showing me, and again, part of our guessing games when I was really little, that she could tell what a person would look like before they came around the corner, um, who that person was, where they were going, what they were doing. And then I would have the opportunity to do the same thing. Of course, this was just presented as child's play. And I presume, although I do not know for a fact, that she was trained in the same way by her own mother. So it's something that is just, just a natural part of who I am. And I feel as a biologist, which eventually I did become a biologist and it got my master's and PhD in biology, particularly in comparative anatomy, physiology, uh, really focusing on arthropods um, because they were very easy to, relatively easy to use as experimental subjects in my studies on muscle and nerve interaction during metamorphosis. Um, my sense is that 
these abilities are something which are handed down in family lines that it's very much like musical ability or, or say artistic ability, like the graphic arts, um, like the ability of people have sometimes in sports or business. It's, in, it's both innate in that a person is born with certain physiological abilities, but then also encouraged in the family. So there's both an innate quality and then a, a new call a quality of nurturance and encouragement. Unfortunately, among the many, many, many people I have read for over the many years I've been doing this, which is about 40 years, so many people tell me that they have abilities and definitely they do, but that in their early childhood, they were told not to use them for one reason or another. And it would be very much as if you, have, you were born as a child to people who were sightless and they said, don't use your eyes, don't read, because you might read something that is inappropriate. We all have to choose how we use our abilities. And that's the very, very most important point of this. These, I believe, when I'm talking about these, I'm talking about extended sensory perception abilities, including, but not limited to, telepathy, and, of course, that clairvoyance, clair, all of the clairs, clairsentience. All of these, I believe, are innate abilities, and each of us carries the responsibility of how we are to use these. So I think boundaries are so important. Ethical guidelines are extremely important. So I hope that answers a bit of what you're asking, Stuart. Kay, looking back over the last 25 or 30 years as a musician, it's natural for me, at least, to try to get a sense of the tempo of these enigmas and how they unfold. And there seems to be an acceleration of late in the phenomena. But perhaps more importantly, also the way in which humans are engaging and disclosing their experiences publicly. The mood in the culture is shifting, and it seems the rate of change is increasing. Is that just my projection, or is something wider occurring pertaining to disclosure? There will be disclosure from the grounds up. So it, it, it's a ground swell of disclosure. When we reach a critical level of consciousness where there's um, a certain percentage of the population worldwide is aware, then you know, more formal disclosure is, is not even a factor, is not necessary. So groundswell of disclosure is happening at this time. And it's, it, it's unfolding very rapidly, I'm being told. We're, we're not talking about years. We're talking about months. We're talking, you know, very fast. In these issues around high sense perception and the anomalous, Many of our biggest obstacles are the various worldviews. It's not a lack of data. It is the disparate worldviews. Whether we want to go back to the Rhine Institute or Dean Radin's work, a materialist reductionist is not going to admit the data which diverges from their ossified worldview. Conversely, no amount of rational insight can move a fundamentalist. We inhabit multiple realities. Worldviews are experience filters of these realities. And one, high sense perception is known to be absolutely real and is not only taken seriously, but employed in government, military, alphabet, black programs. And that's gone on forever. They're not asking if it's real. They're using it. They're implementing these gifts. In another reality, science became scientism and man handles the public discourse. Truly ignorant reductionism discounting these natural capacities. So what damage is done to our human potential because of the way these gifts have been marginalized and delegitimized unfairly by various parties? Well, there's a saying in science that science proceeds one funeral at a time. And many of the people who 
um, are highly invested in the older view of the world, the Newtonian scientific view, they're not going anywhere. <laughs> they've written books, they've taught classes, they have professorships, they, uh, their whole livelihood is based on this particular, a particular worldview. And I'm talking now about the scientists and the people in religion too. So both of these, uh, same, they're going to be passing. And as they do younger people, and they may be not just dying, but their influence is passing. Younger people, more informed people, with minds that are a bit more open, uh, then come into places of power. They're writing the books, they're teaching the classes. And as that happens, science marches on and religion evolves. And what happens with religion is that people get revelations, right? And then the revelations come into greater um, prominence among the people who are attending to such revelations. We have seen some of those revelations coming into the Catholic Church, which is wonderful, and into some other churches. Revelations about the ability, or shall we say, I won't say ability, but the giving permission for people who are true believers to believe also in extraterrestrial beings, existence of other life forms throughout the universe. It's, it's no longer considered in the Catholic Church, through papal decree, actually, um, to be anti-Christian. That's something to get you burned a few hundred years ago, get you burned at the stake. But it's so not so anymore. Now, we're waiting for we, I'd say the grand we, all of us are kind of waiting for physics to catch up so that there's a greater understanding of the multidimensional nature of our reality. Once it's truly understood and accepted by any third grader that our world is a multidimensional world, hey, it's easy to talk about interconnecting realities, um, not just Einstein, Rosenberg bridges, which, of course, are already um, hypothesized and known to be true in black holes. But how these interface with the reality of your child or my child or great, children, great grandchildren of ours as they go about their, their worlds. And so it's a matter of evolution of thought. But uh, the evolutionary situation in our consciousness as humans throughout the world is moving ahead at a pace that I believe has never before been as fast. And it is because it's being facilitated by communication. People can now communicate with others and they can reach out to others clear across the world in great numbers. I mean, millions and millions of people. This means that the physical communication of people is beginning to approach the telepathic communication of people. That has always been the case. Yeah, let's stay with that thread a bit longer. Another way our reality can feel divided is that on one hand, everyone who is in a position to know within the alphabets, military, black programs, has known for half a century there is a highly advanced non-human presence here. It's taken deadly seriously and is worked with. It's not going away. In fact, seems possibly to be ramping up. Millions and millions of humans are engaged with it around the world across demographics over generations. So that's one reality. Another reality is the public-facing narrative where we're fed pablum from the Neil deGrasse Tysons of flat scientism mocking and disparaging the very idea that highly advanced non-human beings are here. This is part of what can make experiencers feel like they're taking crazy pills. They've been face-to-face -face with the entities, often throughout their lives. They are in long-term relationships with this reality. 
Then they see utterly ignorant, highly degreed professors from astronomy departments or popularizers of science books making vile, impugning statements about experiencers and abduction. The experiencers don't have the luxury of doubting it. They live with it. They've moved on to dealing with it. My question to you is, are we going to wake up in time to this reality at the scale it will demand with the maturity it requires? We face a kaleidoscope of crisis. The urgency is compounded by the fact that the others themselves are yelling at us, hey, wake up, you're in a biocidic freefall. Time is running out. Do you feel we will rise to the occasion in time? Oh, um, I'm not a fortune teller, of course, nor would I, I'm not a prophet, (laughs) nor would I presume to predict the future. But I can just say, observing the attitudes of people in my own lifetime, that there has been a great movement toward greater communication, more open sharing, and therefore more, I would say, common sense and clear-eyed thinking about these phenomena. Silence and secrecy are the enemies. We do not need to be silenced. We need to be sharing. And then as we're sharing more, and people such as yourself and the other people that uh, you are working with through your podcast and other communications, you are helping to foster that exchange so people don't feel they are alone and they're not isolated. That is the best solution, I feel. And I feel optimistic because of the fact that we have a great potential for world communication. Now, I must say, the world has always been in crisis. We can barely imagine what it must like must have been like back in the days of the Black Death, the plague, where people were throwing their bodies out into the street every morning. And the bone collectors would come and pick up the bodies and take them to the bonfires or the bonfires. We can't even imagine what it must like have been like um, in the midst of World War II, World War I, or even back in all the other countless wars. But the thing is that we have more communication now. And due to the fact that we do, that I feel is, is, is very promising. Now, there still are areas of our life where I feel greater communication is needed. And one of those has to do with art. And a few years ago, I researched and wrote an article called Close Encounters of the Artistic Kind, and I published it, had it published in a magazine, the Four Corners Journal. It was a rather obscure little magazine. It was 1997. It was the 50th year anniversary of the Roswell incident and um, also of uh, Kenneth Arnold's observations of the what he called the flying saucers in near um, at the Mount Rainier. At any rate, 1997 was a year when I went around the state of Arizona, my resident state, and into New Mexico. My husband and I interviewed a lot of different artists about their work. These were artists who actually portrayed UFOs in their work. Uh, Jim Nichols, um, uh, Stephen Vincent Johnson, uh, Marcus Tracy, um, Peggy Kane, Jillian Sherwood, these different, and many others. Uh, We interviewed them, and what I was told by the artist was their frustration at the fact that, for instance, taking the work of Jim Nichols, he was told by his agent and others, that he better stop portraying UFOs in his art because he wouldn't be taken seriously if he kept that up. Or that if he did art that had UFOs in it, he would have to do that under a different name, 
In other words, he couldn't paint using his own name because that uh, they would not really take his work seriously if he had UFOs in the work. Experiencer art was just beginning to come on the scene of recognition back in 1997. And I now feel, and I may be an error of this in this, but I feel that experiencer art and artistic expression in general, in which um, uh, unusual aerial phenomena and extraterrestrial biological entities are included, is, are not quite as shunned as they were back then. I think that's one area where there has been some movement. There are still people who are afraid, though. And I know that from personal experience. People who will see such art and go into a fear reaction. But I feel that the education of the world, of the public, through art has been really, really helpful. And of course, that includes movies, you know, uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind and those kind of things, very impactful movies, which I feel though have gone a great uh, deal of interest in people. They've been educating people. They're educational pieces as much as anything else. Here's the reason for this podcast existing. I want to ask you a series of questions about creativity. Creativity itself as the primordial human lineage, everything we hold in high esteem, human culture, language, arts, science, religion, philosophy, it's all a product of this primordial creativity. It's easy to forget human beings have pulled each of these from the ever gestating void of nothing. This is our deep history. What is the creative response? How is it sacred and pivotal? How do you feel about this aspect of our humanity? How does it manifest in your work? Thank you, Stuart. Thank you for asking about that. I, I did write a book called uh, Healing and the Creative Response. And the thesis of my book, after many years of working as an intuitive, but also a spiritual healer, is that as people move through the process of dealing with their grief and trauma and come to a better, more balanced place within themselves, they often find themselves able to create a bit more. Just as we talk about the relaxation response, or we might talk about other responses that are physiological in the body, I believe the creative response is also physiological. And it still can be a very active part of our processing. In other words, people who are associated with some kind of loss, uh, doesn't that mean necessarily the loss of a, of a loved one through death, but it could be loss of a job or just we've just come out of two years of loss with the pandemic. These losses can lead us to greater creativity through the healing response. In other words, it just naturally within a person, one is drawn to greater sharing or greater expression. I can remember, I've also always been a painter and writer all my life. And I can remember a time when I had a particular moment of anger and a lot of loss when I just would take a canvas and just put paint in the paint, I would put something like sand or bird seed or something in the paint. So it had a lot of texture to it. And I would just throw the paint against the canvas to express my feelings of anger and rage in, in that way, in an acceptable way, express them. So I feel that the deep held feelings that we have, the emotions that get somatized, that get locked into our body as tension and illness, they can be safely and productively in, the, in a healthy manner channeled into expression. That expression does not always have to be 
something that is a production of saleable work. And this is where it's so important to realize there's a difference between producing art and experience the production of it and then the execution of artworks for sale or for publication or something like that. Two different processes. So I'm talking now about art as a healing therapeutic process, creativity as a way of working through emotions and stresses. And I believe a lot of experiencer art has fallen into that category. Experiencer art and the manner in which it intersects with extended senses. That's a term I've heard you use. I would love to hear your thoughts on how our extended senses enhance or interact with experiencers' creativity. Well, actually, we can also talk about emotions. And when a person goes through a traumatic event of any sort, they often have maybe a period of shock following that. And then a period of deep emotional processing as they come out of the shock or as they're dealing with the shock. The emotions per se, I feel are one of the accesses routes to extended sensory perception. And the opposite of that is when we are in what's called the beta mind or the typical conversational mind of the day, maybe adding up a column of figures or baking cake or making a pie in, in the kitchen or, you know, preparing our taxes or working on QuickBooks or something. Those are not necessarily emotional experiences, but if we're relating an experience to someone else, telling them about what we saw or what we did or what happened to us or the loss, or we're just thinking about it all by ourselves, often the emotions go very, very deep. And we then are accessing other levels of that mind, mind field other than just strictly the brain. Often people can open up to greater creativity through other means as well. Sometimes exercises, a person might enroll in a Hatha yoga course, maybe at their local uh, uh, gym or recreation center. And they're going into it thinking, hey, this is a great way of exercising. Maybe I'll, I'll drop a few pounds and, you know, meet some people and it'll be fun. And discover that other abilities are starting to open up. Yoga is one great path to stimulating creativity. And there are many others, which sometimes are associated with spinal misadjustments, accidents, things like that. But the main thing is um, we're beginning to stimulate then something called the Kundalini. Did you want to discuss that briefly? Yes, that's what I was hoping to segue into, actually. The Kundalini is a, is a name that comes from the Eastern um, context, which essentially describes the releasing of energies that are described as residing at the base of the spine, and then they move up through the central nervous system to the brain. And when the Kundalini rises, there is the openings of these spiritual centers or subtle energy centers called the chakras. And essentially a person begins to cook on all burners, so to speak. <laughs> well, as an intuitive, I've spent many years going into deep altered state with groups of scientists and have had the privilege of being able to look at different processes. And to me, the Kundalini is a maturation process. It actually has to do with a maturation of the central nervous system, of course, includes the, the, the cranium and the brain, but also the spinal column. The spinal column itself uh, has a passive circulation of cerebral spinal fluid. In other words, 
The only way cerebral spinal fluid ordinarily gets moved around too much in the column is through our movements. That's why yogic movements you know, help to move it. And this maturation process of awakening the Kundalini, as I have seen it, has to do with awakening these micro, what are called micro fasciculations or tiny, tiny little movements in the lining of the spinal column that's, that's lining inside the, verte the, the vertebra that's housing the spinal cord and then the lower part of the spinal cord called the cauda equina of all of the, the um, nerves at the bottom. So what happens is there's greater oxygenation to the spinal column and then <clears throat> a greater circulation of the cerebral spinal fluid up into the ventricles of the brain as the kundalini rises. What happens then is many of the deep cells within the physical brain, which often exist in a state of hypoxia, in other words, they are so oxygen starved, they're barely functioning, all of a sudden wake up and people then then have access to a lot more physical brain than they did before. And we find people who have the Kundalini awakened, so to speak, all of a sudden be able to do amazing things. And the work of Gopi Krishna and other people of, about their experience with Kundalini is astonishing. You, people become highly creative often and in ways that are not anticipated. And as I recall, and I could be wrong, Gopi Krishna describes in his book, Living with Kundalini, um, how he began to write poetry in Swedish. <laughs> it's like, wow, here's this East Indian gentleman <laughs> writing poetry in Swedish. And so all of these amazing abilities, which ordinarily are not accessed with people, awaken. So I feel that these high sense perception faculties are also awakened more. And this can happen after injury to the brain. Sometimes people have a blow to their brain. It can be um, near-death experiences. It can be other revelatory experiences where people go off and meditate and or go on a, um, the power kind of searching where you might have some kind of an initiation. Sometimes people do it through the use of ayahuasca and other drugs, and I find that to be rather risky. I do not recommend that just because of the risks involved. But the main thing is, I think it's a physiological change, greater oxygenation, basically, but it's also the removal of other toxins that happen to be in the cerebral spinal fluid to greater exchange. And then the person just has more access to a greater part of their brain and, you know, these abilities. The spinal cord, which acts as a conduit for the kundalini, is that related to the cord we hear about so often in out-of-body experiencers or etheric travel? No, okay. that's a different thing. No. Uh, the, the spinal column, the spinal cord is your physical um, spinal column that goes from the base of the skull, you know, from the cerebrum, the base of the brain, through the vertebra in your column. It, it, this is uh, your spinal cord. And that is bathed in cerebral spinal fluid. But what I'm saying is there's a greater circulation of the cerebral spinal fluid. Now, the cord you're talking about is the cord which is perceived by people often when they do an out-of-body um, experience where they see themselves as corded in the umbilical region usually, but it could be other places as well, between the etheric body, which is the body of the consciousness and the physical body. Remember we talked about the physical brain and then they talk about the mind field. Well, those two are separable. <laughs> by volition, in some cases, and sometimes by accident, people will be in a very traumatic situation and they find themselves rising above the physical body and observing the physical body. 
as also after death, the physical body left behind in the etheric body hovers nearby for a period of time and then moves on in consciousness, of course, different dimensions. Also, individuals can have uh, apparitions, that is, they can appear in more than one place at a time. This is absolutely understandable in quantum physics when we realize that all matter winks in and out of corporeality, that this is very solid, and then it's pure energy, and then it's very solid again, and then it's pure energy, billions of times per second. And also, further to elaborate on that, it can become corporeal to a varying degree. So an individual just becomes less and less and less corporeal and more and more and more pure energy. And that is often done through adjustment of what I call the etheric template, where that interface between matter and energy. And it's possible through the will or volition to be in different dimensions at the same time or to be in two different places or more different places in the same dimension. So again, we're talking quantum physics here. Within quantum mechanics, we will often hear physicists and experts asserting that the quantum effects we observe in non-locality or entanglement by location, experts will assert that none of that is scalable. So yes, it's true subatomically in the micro realms, but it never scales to the macro realms. Never believe never. <laughs> I'm not a physicist, I'm just an artist on a good day. But that assertion is contradicted by the evidence, the accounts, the research, and the application of the research. Absolutely. And I think what happens, uh, Stuart, with all due respect to quote-unquote experts, is they often become blinded to things outside of their own field because it takes so much effort. It takes so much time. It takes so much energy to become a quote unquote expert in a field. Often you're not reading widely or having an open mind to other things because it just takes a lot to be a quote unquote expert. In my case, as an intuitive, my mind has been skating on the ice rink of consciousness for so long <laughs> I realize uh, that um, maybe I'm not an expert but I certainly have somebody who skated a long way on the ice rink of life and <laughs> the consciousness and I gotta tell you it's very scalable <laughs> there's something hilarious in physicists whose work is by definition bounded to objective reality they just can't keep their little hands out of the consciousness cookie jar, particularly with the advent of quantum. Schrodinger saying consciousness is a singular, the plural of which is unknown. And that's funny because in part we're delving subjectivity here, the way in which subjectivity and objectivity are inextricably enjoined. There are no objects without subjects. How do you feel about physicists intoning about consciousness and subjectivity, when if we are to be strict about it, that's not their domain. I feel that anybody, and I'm not talking about physicists per se, but any individual who speaks in absolutes is on very shaky ground. And, you know, absolutes just, just, you know, just, just don't usually work. A person needs to be aware and I think very on guard to remain in the learner's mind. Always keep the learner's mind, the learner's eyes, willingness to see things a little bit differently. Because then you're a true scientist. True science is always willing to change. And scientists who do not maintain an open mind to change are not any longer scientists. They are celebrating and following science religiously, which is not a good idea. <laughs> and we've conflated them culturally. 
absolutely, absolutely. And let me define the difference here. There's a difference in thought. In religious thought, which I think is fine, I, you know, I absolutely uphold certain religious principles. Uh, one is told the absolutes and one believes them and does not doubt them. You might talk about how to implement them, how to put them into work in the world. But those are, you're given the absolutes. This is the way the world is and you believe it. In science, the worldview is built on observation and the absolutes can always change. So what it is, is a scientist must always be willing to observe the world and modify his or her interpretation of those observations, formulating a new hypothesis and ultimately testing it. And if it tests out and tests out and tests out, then you move cautiously toward a scientific law, which still can fall. There is nothing in science that is not up for falling if new information comes on board. And the scientists, a true scientist, if they start to believe in the scientific laws as absolutes, they are practicing the, the religion of science with a capital S. And that's unfortunate. And the same is also unfortunate, I feel, if somebody tries to superimpose some kind of presumed scientific truth upon certain religious or uh, testaments that have been interpreted religiously, like um, the descriptions in the New Testament of things that Jesus did or that others did. Um, I think they actually happened. And I just think that they are not understood scientifically. But if a scientist reads it and says, that's just superstition, uh, that's just poppycock, I think they're not being true scientists. And so it's, it's a, just a matter of definition here and clear thinking. Let's circle back to ayahuasca and various psychotropic compounds, entheogens, etc as part of consciousness exploration. Including typical things, wine, beer, whiskey. Yes, so could you share what are the risks in these paths? How should people be advised to take up best practices around them, including meditation, perhaps? Yeah, it would not be my place to judge anyone's use of these things. If, if that's part of their tradition and their lineage, then absolutely they need to do what is part of their tradition and their lineage. Um, in my tradition and my lineage, um, nothing like that would be used. And uh, that includes nicotine, that includes um, caffeine, <laughs> that includes sugar to some extent. Sugar is a drug. And it, it, just to realize we cannot live these pure lives. Yeah, I, I eat some chocolate. I admit that. I love chocolate. <laughs> but these other things which are like ayahuasca and such, I don't want people to become dependent upon them. Unless it is their tradition that they feel they really is in, in a holy way, like if they belong to the church that uses that. Hey, you know, far be it for me to say don't do that. Uh, but for me, I feel that one can access these um inner realms and inner abilities much more reliably without the use of some kind of external tool. Because essentially what happens, it's just like the, the reader who heard the famous story of the reader who read um, crystal balls and was in a conference and was, was asked a question from somebody on the dais, would you please give me an interpretation of saying, well, I don't have my crystal ball, I can't do it. Well, no, oh, what do you do when you don't have the ayahuasca? Or when you don't have, you mean you can't make new access? <laughs> I mean, like, really? Uh, it, it's, it's something <laughs> external. Uh, you, you want, this is all internal. And a person has the ability to, to do access through deep, deep, deep. Now, you mentioned meditation. I absolutely believe in meditation. I've been meditating regularly since 1970 when I first started 
meditation through the Edgar Casey study group that I belonged to in 1970, joined in 69. Um, but I was also trying meditation as a child. Self-hypnosis and hypnosis in general, I also feel is a very safe way of deepening access and then also dream work. But the other ways can sometimes lead to a kind of a distorted or premature opening of some of the conduits within the consciousness. Not that it always does by any means. Um, it, there again, we're going to have to be working, I think, very carefully with under supervision, so to speak, of masters who know what they're doing in order to use some of these other things. But you also have to be careful. Um, over the years, I was asked to do readings at parties and stuff. I always refused. If I thought the people would be coming for a reading, to get a reading would be drinking liquor or whatever. You know, it just distorts the field so much, it really makes a reading very difficult. Not difficult, but misleading sometimes. Because the, the field gets very distorted. What is the lineage you're a part of? Going back to the Celtic tradition of the second site. Uh, that's the, the lineage. How do you feel that lineage is doing today? It goes back thousands of years. Has it maintained vitality? Fluctuated? Has it atrophied? Has it continued to evolve? Can that even be tracked? I certainly that's... couldn't speak for the entire... My goodness, I couldn't speak for the entire thing. Um... I do know that in, it's beyond what I can really discuss today, but I do know that um, certain family groups are well known. I'll just put it that way. For more information on K. Randall May, check the show notes. To become a patron or a pluser, just fucking click the link in the show notes. Patrons and plusers of this show become doctors. How do you know you're a doctor? It's a feeling. You just have a feeling like no one's watching. A feeling like you're going to get away with this. You know what's great about feelings? They prove things facts can't. You don't need a license to tell you what you're already feeling. You feel doctorful. Wake up. A degree won't make you a doctor any more than medical training can make you a physician. You know you're a doctor. It's in the guts. Other people's guts. You just start operating on other people's guts. And pretty soon, you feel doctorful. Because that's a doctor's job. And you're doing it. It's not brain surgery, unless it is, which is fine. Because you're a doctor. But even when you feel doctorful, don't expect everyone to be happy for you. Because they are sick. Sick with envy. Envy sickness makes people do crazy things. Things like prosecute doctors for practicing medicine without a license. Or convict doctors of practicing medicine without a license. You know, it reminds me of something nurses often say. You're not a doctor. But people say lots of things to doctors. Things like, is this part of the examination? Feeling like a doctor means you're probably going to get accused of a lot of things you did. Before you know it, you end up in jail, where everyone's a proctologist. In jail, you reflect, ask yourself the big questions like, after all I've been convicted of, do I still feel like a doctor? No, I don't. I feel like the best doctor because laughter is the best medicine <laughs> that's what they say right well that's what they say until you tickle a sick person's armpit with your penis then laughter is illegal and the law will rip your gift of healing right out of the armpits of the infirm then who suffers the sick it's funny though laughter can't cure everything that's why as a doctor if I don't know how to help you, I will. I will help you with something that feels medical. A procedure or an invasive procedure. Because I took an oath. Do no harm. And I do no 
harm. Being a doctor is about what you do, not where you are. Say, for instance, I'm in jail. I keep doctoring. I keep doing cutting-edge research. Literally, I found this thing with a sharp edge and I use it to cut stuff. A hole in the wall. A tunnel in the ground. Right now, I'm performing a doctor endectomy. That's when you surgically remove a doctor from jail so he can get back to work. Because as my patients like to say, you make me sick. Which makes me doctorful. Suffocating night keeps my heart asleep. 